Authorities now say that there are six people still missing as a result of the collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge this morning in Baltimore. But what led up to that collapse? Why did a ship run into the bridge in the first place? For more on this subject, I want to bring in a, a guy who knows a lot about the, about shipping and how these ships operate. John Conrad is here. He's the CEO of G Captain. He's a former drill ship captain uh, and on, excuse me, and the author of Fire on the Horizon. Uh, he joins us now. Hello, John. Great to have you with us, sir. Thank you for inviting me on. My, it's, our, it's our pleasure. Uh, so just give, give me your initial reaction. What did you think when you, when you saw the video this morning? Uh, and uh, why, why would a ship run into a bridge like this? Well, I think my first reaction was what probably many of your listeners felt in that visceral reaction of, wow, this is, this is bad. I, I, I replayed it multiple times, and it almost seemed unbelievable to me. But as you analyze the situation, uh, you know, certain problems emerge that, that bring it back into uh, reality. Um, this ship had left the terminal about an hour before and it, uh, swung out past the nuclear ship uh, Savannah and turned, made a U-turn in the channel and headed towards the bridge at a speed of about eight knots, which is about nine miles an hour. And uh, it, it looked like it was, it was doing well. It was staying to the right of the channel as it approached the bridge. And then in the video, you see all the lights go out. Uh, showing that there was a, a either a mechanical or electrical problem, a blackout on a ship. And when this happens on board a ship, you know, the ship goes silent. It's one of those things that as a ship captain, you know, you fear hearing. Um, and it, it continues uh, for a while and it starts losing its heading. Uh, you see black smoke start billowing out of the uh, stack and, um, and, and the, and the, bow cleans right into that uh, post. And uh, unfortunately, there wasn't much uh, protection around this bridge column. So when the bow of that ship hit into the structural steel, the whole thing collapsed. Yes. So when you say there, there's black smoke coming out of the stack, what does that indicate to you? What was happening at that moment? Well, we're really not sure uh, what's happening. And unfortunately, these reports through the NTSB, they've been delayed now. They usually now take over a year to get out. And by that time, the public's lost interest. And this is one of the reasons that problems aren't solved. Right. But there are a couple uh, theories that you can take an educated guess. One is that the ship went into full reverse and put an enormous strain on the engine. Uh, when you put the strain on the engine, uh, in order to slow down, uh, two things happen. One is that uh, you know propellers are are designed to to propel a ship straight ahead, but they're inefficient when they go in reverse. So you often have the the uh, stern kick out to the left and the bow kick out to the right. Um, you can also put a strain on the electrical system. So that is one possibility. There's also a possibility with the environmental regulations, you have to burn cleaner diesel when you are in port. Mm -hmm. And when you leave port and you get out to open ocean, you can burn the dirtier uh, diesel. You are supposed to wait until you get completely out of the port, but sometimes um, you know, the engine room crew wants to go to bed or they prepare, or as you're just lining it up to prepare, they couldn't make a mistake. So there could be a human element uh, to the story they also, you know, there, there could be these crew ships are minimally manned. I mean, this, this ship is almost the size of an uh, aircraft carrier, which has 5,000 people on. This ship had less than 25. So the computer systems in, in the engine room, the crew is tired. They, they want to get off early. The, the engine room is, goes unmanned at night. So it's possible that someone switched it to computer control uh, you know, before, you know, at a, in an inopportune time, you know, we don't know, we don't know yeah. what happened exactly, but, you know, we know that there was either a mechanical or human error. All right, let's, I want to back up for a moment, just talk about the basics of ships like this. This is, is this a, a standard size container ship? Is this a kind of a, a normal size for a container ship? And how much weight uh, and, and, and ultimately, uh, uh, physical pressure are we talking about? This is a pretty big uh, vessel to slam into a bridge. 
Right. We we saw the Ever Given uh, get caught in the Suez Canal a few years ago, and then its, uh, its sister ship get caught leaving Baltimore a few years ago. Those are mega ships that have 24,000 containers to use on board. This one was a bit smaller. This one has a capacity for 10,000 TEUs, and uh, it was carrying 4,600 TEUs. Um, the total weight was 116,000 dead weight tons. So it, it's still a very, very sizable ship, not, not the mega ships that, that we, we saw clog the Suez Canal, but still mm -hmm. really large vessel. And when a ship like that leaves port, uh, th there's, my understanding is there's a lot of safety procedures for how a ship both enters and exits a port. Um, were, you know, did, did they receive assistance all the way up to the Francis Scott Key Bridge? Are there people helping them on their way out, or are they kind of on their own by the time they get to that point in the water? Right. There's a vessel traffic service, which is like air traffic control, but there's a major difference. Air traffic control can order a pilot to change course or heading the vessel traffic service is only an advisory service. So they advise the pilot and it's up to the pilot and the captain on board to decide what they're going to do. There's the captain of the ship, he's ultimately responsible. And then there's another captain who's an American who's local to that port. And we were told there were two of these pilots on board at the time. And they're the real experts in the port and the facilities. And then the Coast Guard captain of the port is in charge of the regulations for that port. So the Coast Guard um, captain of the port will decide what safety procedures are needed for what ships. So someone made the decision that the ships could uh, discharge the tugboats before the bridge. So when the power went out in the bridge, there was no backup. You know, those tugboats are an incredible backup because they can slow the ship down and move its bow out. But without those tugs there, there, there was no alternative system um, to save it from running into the, uh, into the structure. So the tugboats would have been with this ship for a little bit, but not all the way to what this is about four miles out, I think, from the port, right? Yeah, I'm told that the tugboats were released 17 minutes before uh, the incident. So ideally, I uh, those, those tugboats would have gone through through the bridge, but there's enormous pressure from these shipping companies because as these ships have grown in size, the tugboats have grown in size and complexity. So it's really expensive to have these tugboats standing by and, and not doing anything. So the shipping companies often press back um, and say, hey, we don't want tugs. And on the pilots in the port as well, because there's always the threat with these shipping companies. It, if you charge us too much money with all these safety regulations, we're just going to go to the port of New York or Savannah or somewhere else where the restrictions are less. So often these, these safety regulations in different ports play against each other. And, you know, the safety of the citizens is, is what's left at risk. Uh, some of the images we've seen today of this ship, which is known as the Dali, uh, flying under a Singaporean flag, um, some of the images show that it does have an anchor that is dropped. We don't know when the anchor dropped, do we? And is it, is it customary if you lose power to try and throw the anchor to, to stop the ship? Is, would that have been a customary move? Absolutely. You know, there were two incidents where bridges were hit before the, the Tampa Skyway Bridge back in 1980, which was catastrophic and many people died similar to this one. And then about 15 years ago, uh, there was the uh, Costa Busan hit the Bay Bridge in Oakland. Uh, it was coming in fog and misjudged, uh, um, and the pilot overrode the vessel traffic service. But one of the things that came out in there is, well, why didn't, if there was confusion, why didn't they just anchor? So, you know, pilots know that if they're in trouble, they should anchor. But the problem is they were already too close to the bridge to be able to safely anchor. Yes. So my belief is if they did it before, which I hope they did, it was just an effort to slow down uh, the ship so there's less force into that. You know, they had already decided they're probably going to hit. Just let's try to reduce that force. Or 
after they hit, it's standard procedure. When you have a collision, you, you drop the anchor. We're not sure which it is. I do see uh, some reporting today. Sky News says that the Dali ship dropped its anchors as a part of an emergency proceeding before crashing into the Francis Scott Key Bridge, according to the Singapore Port Authority. That's the report uh, as of this afternoon. So uh, if that's the case, I do wonder, I, I, watching the video, you, do, you see the ship almost swing towards the column of the bridge. Is it possible that anchoring could have led to that action that the ship swung as a result of the anchor tugging on it? Well, uh, the anchor is a tricky in this scenario. So first of all, you have to have a crew up there and they're ready to lower the anchor, but you have sure. to know how deep that water is. So if you don't drop it far enough, it's not going to touch the bottom. If then from you know, touching the bottom to three times the water depth, the anchor will just bounce on the bottom and the maneuverability of the ship, the center of pivot, you know, it's normally around where the house is. But if you drop that anchor just to touch the bottom, the pivot goes all the way to the bow. So the ship does become a lot more maneuverable and swing. And then if you drop it more than three times the water depth, that chain starts to lay out and it digs in. You don't want to do that if you're going this fast, if you're going eight knots, because if that anchor digs in, when you're going at that speed, you could rip the whole bow out or at least the winch. Yeah. And then uh, finally, and, and thank you, by the way, for, for all of your expertise here. This is uh, very valuable to us, John Conrad. Uh, if you've, you know, for these bridges, I, I, you know, sitting here as just an amateur thinking about all of this, I was wondering why there weren't more barriers of some kind before a bridge could actually reach the column, the support column that holds up an entire bridge. Um, is, it, is it your experience that there are some more modern bridges, for instance, that do have uh, barriers kind of in the intervening space so that a ship can't make it quite as far as to hit the main structural uh, column? Absolutely, and that's what we saw with the Costco Busan. It hit the Oakland Bay Bridge and there was no damage to the bridge it tore a giant rip down the side of the ship, um, which spilled a lot of oil into the bay, but the bridge wasn't damaged itself because of a much larger concrete footprint around those columns. So larger bridges like the Bay Bridge or the Golden Gate or the Verrazano, they will have much larger concrete you know, uh, sections. And that, you know, that'll stop the ship before it hits into the steel. The problem here was that that bow kind of you know, all that force is going right in that top lip of that bow section, which overhung the concrete and hit right into the steel. But the question is then with infrastructure, you know, the we've had a $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill. Out of that, Secretary Pete has approved uh, less than $1 billion for all of the ports. So this is less than 1% of all the infrastructure. The amount going to electric buses is at least four times the amount going to all the ports, all the harbors in the entire nation. So if you were to build these uh, you know, structures around the bridge, you would also have to potentially dredge the canal or build a bigger bridge. And we yeah. saw this with the Bayonne Bridge in New York where they spent billions of dollars to raise it up. Well, a lot of that money was, was spent or was pushed on the local taxpayers in, in Newark because the federal government, the Maritime Administration, particularly under Pete Buttigieg, is broken and has been torn apart over the years. So the FAA has 40 to 45,000 employees. The Maritime Administration, MARAD, which sits right next to the FAA and under Pete Buttigieg, it only has 800 employees mm. and half of them work at the Merchant Marine Academy. So even if they, they got on the ball and they wanted to do more to spend on, you know, as this infrastructure team, they wanted to spend more on the dredging and the bridge abutments and the ports, you know, they, they don't have the personnel to, uh, to handle these projects. Yeah. And Congress does not have a, a you know, major compunction to, to fix this. A few congressmen do, Congressman Garamendi, uh, a Democrat and, um, Waltz, a Republican, or two that are, you know, fighting for a bigger stake of this infrastructure bill. But we spent all this money, and it's not going, you know, and it's not just here, but you see 
the Mississippi River is drying up and so, you can't dredge it, and there are problems around the country. So you said that the infrastructure package spends four times as much on electric vehicles as it does on, on ports and, and infrastructure there? At least. And I'm talking ports and maritime infrastructure for the entire yeah. nation. This includes Hawaii, Alaska, the rivers, the waterway systems. Yes, yes it's been less than a, a billion dollars. So electric uh -huh. buses have gotten a lot more subsidies. Yeah, and they're way more useless. Uh, the, the ports are more critical. The bridges are more critical. Uh, thank you very much. John Conrad, CEO of G Captain. really appreciate your expertise today and your time. Thank you so much for joining us.